You're watching News Round, a recap of stories that made headlines during the week. Uh, let's uh, get the headlines right now. National Assembly votes in Constitution Amendment Bill. All four women-related bills fail. And European Mission Election Observation Team commends President Buhari's assent to Electoral Amendment Bill. Almost 1,000 Nigerians arrived at Abuja after fleeing war in Ukraine. Plus, over 1 million refugees flee Ukraine in one week. All right, so we'll begin our news round from the National Assembly, where financial and administrative autonomy has been granted to all local governments across Nigeria. The lawmakers also voted for independent candidacy in elections and separated the office of the Attorney General of the Federation from that of the Minister of Justice. They, however, voted against pension for presiding officers and threw away all gender bills. It's one of the most important endeavors to be undertaken by the Ninth Assembly the amendments of a 1999 constitution. Previous assemblies have had a go at amending the constitution with varying levels of success. Pursuant to section 12 of section 4. Of On Tuesday, these federal lawmakers in the Senate and House of Representatives are voting on 68 constitution amendment bills. Some of these bills center on issues which have captured public interest over the years. Enforcement of legislative summons. Voting begins and legislators in both chambers are in favor of bills devolving powers from the center to the federating units, namely local government financial autonomy, financial independence of state houses of assembly and state judiciary, to move airports from the exclusive legislative list to the concurrent legislative list, to allow states generate, transmit and distribute electricity in areas not covered by the national grid, and to move railway from the exclusive legislative list to the concurrent legislative list, to move value-added tax to the exclusive legislative list, it's a bill for an act to alter the provisions of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria 1999 to establish local government councils as a tier of government and guarantee their democratic existence. Legislators in the Senate and House of Representatives vote in favor of some Constitution Amendment bills for good governance and welfare of citizens, namely time frame for the submission of names of ministerial and commissioner nominees, time frame for conduct of census, Separation of the office of the Attorney General from that of the Minister of Justice. Free and compulsory basic education. It's time frame for the submission of the names of ministerial or commissioner nominees. Result. Yes, 93. No, 1. Abstain, 0. Total, 94. This bill is also passed. On bills to guide the electoral process, legislators in both chambers vote in favor of independent candidates, restriction of formation of political parties, but they also threw out bills on termination of tenure on account of change of political party and diaspora voting. However, some critical bills failed, namely procedure for overriding the president's veto for constitutional alteration, timelines for the determination of civil and criminal cases, and virtual court hearing. Also, some bills personal to the legislature were thrown out, namely pension for presiding officers of the legislature, immunity for presiding officers and heads of judiciary. Also, all gender bills were thrown out. Federal lawmakers in the Senate and House of Representatives have concluded voting on all 68 Constitution Amendment bills.
These bills will now be sent to the State Houses of Assembly for voting. Now, we really did not see much bills with direct impact on the security situation in the country. Curiously, the bill which seeks for the creation of state police, which has been agitated for by many Nigerians, was not included in this phase of constitutional amendment. From the National Assembly, Linda Akibi, Channels Television News. And meanwhile, all the four women-centered bills in the constitutional amendment process have failed to pass at the National Assembly. Lawmakers voted massively against the bills, including the creation of special seats for women at the national and state houses of assembly. Have you ever heard the phrase, delusions of grandeur? Weeks and months of public engagements and campaigns by female lawmakers and civil society organizations for the women-related constitutional amendment bills before the National Assembly, as well as the visit of the wife of the president, Mrs. Aisha Buhari, last week, when the constitutional amendment bills were laid, all come down to this day. Lawmakers commenced voting for 68 constitutional amendment bills, four of which are related to women. In the Senate, the first bill to create special seats for women in the national and state houses of assembly suffers an instant defeat. This bill has failed and I reluctantly say so. Three other women-related bills suffer the same fate in the upper chamber. Based on the information reaching me... In the House of Representatives, a motion is moved to admit the wife of the Vice President, Mrs. Dolakbo Oshimbajo, but chance of no rent the air. The motion is put to vote and Mrs. Oshimbajo is ushered in. 208 members out of 290 present vote against the bill to create special seats for women in the national and state houses of assembly. Then it's time to vote for a bill to provide for 35% affirmative action for women in political party administration. Since in the voting pattern, a lawmaker and a speaker appeal to members for at least a reduction in their location to no avail. We may be able to reach a form of a consensus on this floor on the need to ensure greater participation for women folk without necessarily discriminating against the men folk by reducing the percentage proposed in this clause from 35 to 15. They come out on mass to vote for you and I. You cannot now be seen working against their interests. This particular provision on party, on party administration, I will publish, I will publish this vote. Another to allow women take up indigenship of their husband's state also suffers the same fate. After sitting through the sad turn of events, a disappointed wife of the vice president, Mrs. Dolakbo Shimbajo, takes her leave. The demand was because we have capacity. We don't believe it is a favor. We know we have the capacity. And we know this isn't the end of the story. The Minister of Women Affairs and other female lawmakers are also disappointed. What has happened has taken us years back. However, this is a time for women to sit back, unite and be one. I do not want to believe that even people who co-sponsored the B yes. came out this morning to yes. vote against what they are sponsoring. part of sponsoring. There are policies that affect only women and it only pinch, those of us that pinches that can know how to address such issues. In a last ditch move, the speaker gives special consideration to a bill to provide for a minimum of 20% for women in ministerial and commissioner nominees. The system is down and I'm going to put the question. Those in favor of the 20% for women say aye. aye. Those against please say name. Aye. Clearly, two, uh, two thirties, uh, the eyes have it. 20% for women. Aye. This turns out to be a fruitless move as the bill was rejected by the Senate. Female lawmakers are furious, disappointed with the turn of events and in their male colleagues. In the coming days, the reactions from the civil society organizations will not be mild, considering how much work was put into ensuring that these female-related bills are passed by the National Assembly. Terry Ikumi, Channels Television News. And more commendations are coming on the heels of the president's assent uh, to the Electoral Act Amendment Bill, this time from the European Union Election uh, Observation Team. 
team believes that the Electoral Act 2022 has a range of measures that will improve the electoral process in a country. The European Union Elections Follow-up Mission to Nigeria is completing its tour of the country after assessing the implementation of the 2019 EU recommendations and discussing further reform. The mission held the exercise at a time when the president signed into law the 2022 Electoral Act, an instrument that is expected to transform the nation's electoral process. The passing of the new Electoral Act is a very positive step forward. The new Act comprehensively introduces a range of measures that improve the election process. It is impressive how the National Assembly, INEC and civil society worked together on this. It is a big achievement that paves the way for improvement in future electoral processes. In its final report, the mission wants the Independent National Electoral Commission to improve on the use of technology, especially the Bimodal Voter Accreditation System, BIVAS. Another serious challenge is the introduction of new technology for the accreditation of voters in polling units. We urge INEC to do a comprehensive lessons learned exercise in the use of BIVAS and to have an independent evaluation of their use and to develop a full plan accordingly. This need to include provision for integrity checks, risk mitigation, contingency planning, as well as provision for independent scrutiny and public information. The European Union delegation in Nigeria has undertaken long-term support to strengthening democracy and electoral processes in Nigeria. The regional body is not relenting in funding efforts to ensure a credible electoral process in Nigeria. The new program, uh, which amounts to 39 million uh, euros, uh, has uh, the overall objective to foster a functioning, pluralistic, inclusive, participatory and representative democracy in, uh, in Nigeria with uh, uh, six main areas. The mission also raises concerns that the increase in spending limits for candidates creates incentives for corruption. From Abuja, Dili Amoyeni, Channels Television News. And despite representing just 17% of the world's population and emitting just 4% of global pollution, Africa stands as the most affected continent in terms of climate change. Environment experts at the ongoing 8th Africa Regional Forum for Sustainable Development in Kigali say African economies are losing on average 5% of GDP because of climate change, increasing up to 15% in some countries. Available assessment of the 2030 Agenda and Agenda 2063 implementation progress indicate that most African nations are off track to achieve the target and set goals of the two development blueprint within the set time frame. But Africa has shown its willingness to overcome and prevail over its complex development challenges. Delegates here at the opening ceremony of the 8th African Regional Forum for Sustainable Development have been told that now is the time for the continent to build on the big wins, especially now that Africa hosts the next climate change conference later this year. Africa needs to be compensated justly through market mechanisms. We can create 360 million jobs we can get $3 trillion off of our carbon because we are saving the world. This is the victory that Africa needs to take to Shamal Sheikh. Highlighting five priorities that could help inform deliberations in Kigali, the United Nations Deputy Secretary General says there is a need to accelerate gender equality and economic transformation. We are far from where we need to be. Debt to GDP ratios have risen to almost 70%. Today, 17 African countries are at risk of debt distress, and four are already in debt distress. The Secretary General has appealed for a serious reform of the international financial architecture, which shamelessly favors rich and punishes the poor. To support the green growth in Africa, the Rwandan president says the African continental free trade area should be used to promote the adoption of sustainable technologies and infrastructure. We have to own and lead the process and support one another. That's why these two 
development agendas are so important. It's about ensuring the stability and prosperity of our continent so that our young people can have the future they deserve. This forum capitalizes on Africa's decade of action, which is a critical decade to reinvigorate the continent's pace to attain the SDGs, realize Africa Agenda 2063, and fulfill the Paris Agreement's ambitions. The road to achieving these objectives is somewhat difficult, but many delegates say their priority is to ensure that building the Africa we want does not remain just a slogan. From the Kigali Convention Center in Rwanda, Ayola Kasim, Channels Television News. And One News Round returns. Almost 1,000 Nigerians arrive at Abuja from Ukraine. we we'll get that in a moment. Just stay with us. Welcome back. Well, almost uh, 1,000 Nigerians have now returned to the country after fleeing the war in Ukraine following its invasion by Russian troops. Evacuees, mostly students, arrived at the Inamdi International Airport of Buja in three batches from Romania, Poland and Hungary. The flight from Romania, conveying Nigerians stranded there while fleeing from the war in Ukraine, was built to touch down in Abuja at 3.30 a.m. As the hours go by, the media awaits any information on when the plane would arrive with the returnees. Finally, at about 7 a.m., the plane landed, carrying with it over 450 students and a few government officials. The welcome party, made up of several government agencies on board the aircraft, and they addressed the returnees. As we come down in two files, we will walk straight uh, to meet with Port Authority, and uh, there the Health Port Authority will give you forms to fill. We will only take your samples uh, for the COVID test, as you are all aware it was waived for us before you got on the plane. Uh, the moment that is done, you will be directed to immigration, and as soon as you are done with immigration, we will direct you to where you will collect a token of transportation for you to be able to head back home. The majority leader of the House of Representatives, who was part of a delegation that went to Romania to bring back the returnees, says Nigeria's foreign missions need to be better prepared for crisis situations such as this one. Federal Minister of Foreign Affairs through the federal government next time uh, going forward should try to envisage some of these things as by way of emergency anticipation. So that when we are budgeting, we budget for the missions to be able to address these kind of circumstances whenever they come up. Meanwhile, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs lays out its plans for the returnees, especially in terms of continuing the education. Our government is already talking with the, the governments of Poland, of Greece, of uh, Romania and Hungary to see if those of them that are in their fifth year medical student, I mean medical year, fifth and sixth year, can actually go back to universities in these countries to be able to complete their studies. While the students are being profiled and tested for COVID-19, they would be given $100 each to return to their various destinations across the country. And it was indeed a deep sense of relief to be back at home after enduring eight days of the ordeal that followed the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. While thanking the government for the evacuation effort, evacuees also call on the nation's foreign missions to be better equipped to handle these types of emergencies. The returnees from Romania have a story to tell, one which many young Nigerians may never experience in their lifetime. The experience of a full-blown war and what it means to have a refugee status outside of Nigeria. Where she wants to be Weary from their travels and traumatized by the idea that they could have been killed in the war between Russia and Ukraine, these over 400 young Nigerians, mostly students, tell us what it was like to escape the conflict. 
We were struggling, people were screaming, there was like a lot of tussle to get across the line. I even saw someone climb over people's heads just to get like into the border. It was like really very stressful crossing the Ukrainian side of the border. It was chaotic because everyone was fighting within themselves and nobody wanted to be the last to go. So it was very tight, so everyone was practically pushing. I, they, you know, there was a lot of stampede. I have joint pain, back pain. The sirens were like ringing every day and every day and every day, so that didn't make us feel safe, um, my own friends. So um, at a certain point we left, we went to the Syria border, the border bordering Ukraine and Romania, and from there we were able to like cross, but it was terrible. An overwhelming sentiment among the returnees is the poor treatment they say they experienced from the Nigerian embassy in Kiev, Ukraine. We contacted them and we were like, oh, that, oh, we need like help. Like, What are we doing? What are we going to do? And we were like, students, um, take care of yourself, find a place that is safe. And that was strange to us because we were expecting that, oh, maybe they will organize like a bus that would take all of us to like a border where we could cross from, but that was not the case. Maybe if the embassy in Kyiv like, gave like a special letter to all the borders, maybe Nigerians would have been able to pass easily, more like easily, but we weren't really getting like proper responses from them. There's still so many questions about the impact the war in Ukraine has had on people, but for these kids right behind me, they're just glad to be back home. Right now, they're going to be given a stipend by the federal government to ensure that they get to their respective destinations. A lot of COVID tests are going on right now, and they're hoping that these processes are done quickly so they can go back to their families. Kayla Megwa, Channels Television News. Finally, on news round, the United Nations says at least one million people have fled Ukraine in the week since Russia's invasion, with one official warning that at this rate, the exodus could become the biggest refugee crisis this century. The tally from the UN High Commissioner for Refugees announced on day eight of Russia's invasion amounts to more than 2% of Ukraine's population. Russian forces have taken control of Kherson in the south, the first major city to fall. If they capture more southern cities, Ukrainian forces could be cut off from the sea. In Mariupol, a strategic port near the Russian border, residents are trapped by intense shelling. Kiev remains in government control and a large Russian armored convoy remains some distance away. President Volodymyr Zelensky in his latest video this morning said Ukraine's defense lines were holding against a Russian attack, but there had been no respite in Moscow's shelling of Ukraine since midnight. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov told Russian state television today that he had no doubt that a solution to the Ukrainian crisis will be found. But Russia's dialogue with the West needs to be based on mutual respect. He says that the Third World War will be nuclear, but he also says this is not something Russians are thinking about. He also explains that Moscow's attack on Ukraine is aimed, among other things, at ensuring that its neighbor does not join the United States-led NATO transatlantic military alliance. More than one million people have already fled the country and hundreds of civilians are believed to have been killed. In just uh, seven days, one million people have fled Ukraine, uprooted by this senseless war. I have worked uh, in refugee emergencies for almost 40 years and rarely have I seen an exodus as rapid as this one. Hour by hour, minute by minute, more people are fleeing the terrifying reality of violence. An investigation into possible war crimes and crimes against humanity committed in Ukraine has been launched by the International Criminal Court in The Hague. In the meantime, Ukraine's allies continue to impose sanctions. The United Kingdom says it will cripple Russia's economy. The second thing we need to do is degrade the Russian economy uh, to stop the ability to fund Putin's war machine. And of course, the banking measures are key to that, the measures of SWIFT, the measures we took against the central bank. But it's also important that we need to reduce dependence on hydrocarbons, which ultimately have given Putin the ability to fund this terrible destruction. And French authorities have seized a yacht belonging to Igor Sechin, chief executive of the Russian state energy company Rosneft, as part of the European Union sanctions over the Ukraine invasion.
that's news round for the week thank you for watching i'm laddie williams bye for now